It took place 41 years ago this past week in Madison, Wisconsin. The time to act is now. If they cast their votes clearly and decisively against the war in Vietnam. It was the height of student unrest. On the nation's campuses, there were chants of bring the war home. And on August 24, 1970, they did just that. The explosion at 3.45 this morning ripped through Sterling Hall, which It was a horrific act that was wrong then, it's wrong today, and it changed things in a bad way. The big demonstration was over here. Back in those days, the man who is now Madison's mayor, Paul Soglin, was one of the leaders of student anti-war protests on campus. As he recalls, it all started innocently enough. The anti-war movement adopted a lot of its tactics and strategies from the civil rights movement, which was about 10 years older. It was one of picketing, demonstrating, and passive resistance. The people we support in Vietnam... It was the kind of campus where when, at least in the early 60s, if people had a demonstration, some people would show up in, in jackets, if not ties. Author and commentator Jeff Greenfield a UW student in the 60s, says that as the fighting intensified, so too did student protests. Uh, the escalation of the Vietnam War in 1965, when the bombing began, triggered a wave of increasing anger and demonstrations. What's happening is the numbers are growing and the intensity of the action is growing. Much of it is assisted by what the police do. When Madison police beat Soglin and other students while breaking up a campus protest a few years earlier, Soglin says something changed. I remember that evening we had a meeting and one young woman uh, stands up and says, I don't know what a radical is, but I'm a radical now. She said that experience did it. Keep in mind, that the Madison bombing took place just months after Ohio National Guardsmen shot and killed four students while breaking up an anti-war demonstration at Kent State University. People from that era, you know, like, you know, they, they know the reason why the bombing was done. You Former know, UW know. student Carl Armstrong yeah. says small wonder he felt he was at war with his government. It was like a message sent to us, we're going to kill you. Your demonstrations mean nothing to us. And so that's when we decided to take them head on. I said, Army Math is next. The Army Math Research Center was a Defense Department funded institute on campus that worked on weapons technology. It had become a focal point for student protesters. And that's where Carl Armstrong decided to make his statement. We knew approximately what size bomb we needed, probably a ton of explosives. How did you know that? I was just looking at the size of the building. I had visualized basically Army math being leveled. That would be the perfect statement. Armstrong and his brother Dwight, along with fellow students David Fine and Leo Burt, stole a van, then filled it with explosives. Criteria was that basically no one on the street, no one in the building. So you had a specific time planned? Yeah, the time was the most important because the whole bombing of Army Met, the political success of Army Met depended on no one getting hurt. In the early hours of August 24th, 1970, Armstrong and Leo Burt launched their attack. David had surveilled the building. The problem was he didn't tell me that there were lights on. I felt, you know, really, I mean, really uneasy about it because, you know, we weren't sure, you know, why were these lights on? But you proceeded anyway. Well, I turned to my confederate and I said, uh, he asked me, he says, do we go ahead? Are we going to do this? I think I made a comment to him about something like, uh, now I think I know what war is about. Uh, and I told him to light it. 
The explosion uprooted trees and damaged autos. Windows were shattered for 10 blocks around. It was an ammonium nitrate bomb. Chris Cole is an agent with the FBI in Madison, which investigated the crime. It was generally viewed as the uh, largest, most uh, destructive terrorist attack occurring on U.S. soil prior to the Oklahoma City bombing. And while the bombing was timed to make certain the building was empty, the reality is there was someone there and he was killed. Killed was Robert Fosnock, the father of three. He and others were part of an overnight shift. Uh, Robert Fosnock died in the bombing and people were injured. Armstrong and his Confederates heard the news in their getaway car. All, all of us were saying, oh no. And then I told everybody in the car, I said, uh, maybe with time we'll feel better about this. Has that time come? I don't think he can ever feel good about it. Uh, I felt good about doing the bombing, the bombing per se, but not taking someone's life. There had been deaths on American college campuses already. It's just that the deaths before that were perpetrated by the forces of authority. This time, it was the dissidents. There's no question in the minds of authorities that this was the work of dissident radicals. It not only this was off the, the charts. This was so different than anything that had happened. And Paul Soglin says it hurt the cause. It was supposed to help. When school reopened a couple of weeks later, it was though the, the life had been sucked out of the anti-war movement. I think the Army Math Research Center bombing was the moment when, the, when most everybody in the movement had to look into their own souls and minds and say, what are we about? Carl Armstrong and his brother Dwight, along with David Fine, were eventually caught and imprisoned. Carl served eight years of a 23-year sentence. But the fourth bomber, Leo Burt, disappeared, vanished. Our last um, known sighting of Leo Burt was in late August, early September of 1970 uh, in Petersboro, Ontario. The last time he was ever seen. That's correct. Four decades and counting since that August morning in 1970. There's still a $150,000 reward for his capture, but the trail has grown cold. As for Carl Armstrong, he returned to Madison after his prison term. I've lived a bizarre life, surreal sort of existence. In fact, until recently, Armstrong operated a juice stand, just blocks from the campus building he destroyed. Carl's brother Dwight also returned to Madison. He died last year. And David Fine, who went on to law school but was denied admission to the Oregon bar, has worked as a paralegal. A life sinfully destroyed can never be restored. Robert Fosnock's widow, Stephanie, remained in Madison, where she raised their three children. She never remarried. She chose not to appear in this story, but she did give us a message for Carl Armstrong. She said, I would like him to know that I harbor no ill will towards him, and I never did. I've always felt shame for, you know, taking someone's life and hurting people. Still, Armstrong's message for the last remaining fugitive may surprise you. If he's watching you right now, what would you want to say to Leo? Good job keeping yourself free, Leo. Good job. No hesitation on that message? No. Why? Why? Because to us, there was purity of purpose, and it just went bad. <laughs>